I know it's been a while, but season two is finally here and possibly more. Let's get right into it. The Lions have two players who are retiring this season. Matt Joyce isn't a starter, but he was decent backup. Uh, he won't be brought back. Bracey Walker also wasn't a starter, but he was decent depth. That will also not be returning next season. There were a lot of players that needed to be resigned. A lot of players. I'll go through each position that needed resigning. Joey Harrington is our quarterback, and Meyer and McMahon both needed new contracts. I believe in Harrington, so I'm okay with letting them go and looking for a cheaper option. Olandis Gary is in a group that's overcrowded. I don't plan on bringing him back. Street, Anderson, and Swinton all need new contracts. Ty Streets led the team in receiving yards last season and surprised everyone that he's still pretty good. Of course, I gave him a contract, two years, just in case he regresses. We can move on from him. Uh, Stefan Alexander is another weapon on the offense that needed a new contract. He has a history of doing absolutely nothing after having a decent season, so of course, I resigned him to a two-year deal. Look, I don't like long-term commitment. Dominic Raiola is the only center we have, and it would be a mistake not to re-sign him. I did give him a long-term contract since I figure to sign him for cheap, as I expect he would improve and just cost more over the years. We also have one of the tackles who needed a new contract. I told you, we have a lot of players who need contracts. Stalker McDougal is not a bad player, but finding tackles in the draft without the number one pick is very hard. So I signed him to a safe contract that allows me to cut him anytime if he regresses too hard. Now we're getting to the defensive side, barely. Sean Rogers is the anchor on the defense, still very young. So of course I gave him a long-term six-year deal with the team. He's the future that we must build around. Next up is Robert Porcher at defensive end. He led the team with sacks, but he's also going into his 14th season. Regression is on the horizon for the player. Considering he took a very cheap, team-friendly contract, he might be the best deal of the offseason so far. Wally Rayner is the next player in order of position that needs a contract. All he did was get sacks, so clearly getting resigned. Plus, I'd rather not have to worry about filling a position when I can just do that now. Next man up, Andre Goodman. He, he's not coming back. Jason Hansen is in need of a new contract. I figured, why not another two-year deal? I think we resigned most of the players, and to be fair, we were 8-8, eight and eight, so it's not like this is a team with bad players. Just not enough good ones. In order to get good ones, we need more cap space, and with only 10.5 mil in cap, I felt like we needed to make some more space. Paul Smith is in an overcrowded halfback spot and wasn't used at all last season. He gone. Brad Banta, I'm pretty sure he's just a long snapper. He gone. Corey Redding is actually not a terrible player, but he gone. Another player who didn't get any playing time this season, James Davis. He gone. All the cuts gave us an extra $2 million for free agency. Here are all the top free agents this year. Westbrook leading the pack. But Abraham, Andrezzi, Demulling, Ngunlaye, Coleman, and Dees, they're all positions that we need, defensive end, guard, cornerback, and tackle. I looked into Adewale and Ngunlaye, but we also need to sign our draft picks, so I felt like the price was a bit too steep for me at the moment. I also looked into Derek Dees, but going into his 14th year, he's at best a stopgap player, and I want someone who's going to be here for the long term. So I ended up skipping signing anyone in this year's free agency. So in the first round in this series, I will be drafting mainly defensive end, halfbacks, tackles, or quarterbacks because the computer does the same thing. I don't want to pick the best player available because it seems unfair if the CPU won't. With that being said, let's start the draft. Of course, the first round was our mock draft. Elmer Estrada. His overall doesn't leap out at you, but I do think he's fairly decent at pass rushing and run coverage. Hopefully he develops well. Second round pick was Randall Miles. We need another corner opposite Dre Bly, and I think we found our guy very fast, very quick, and he's pretty good in coverage. He's pretty much an instant starter at this point. Third round pick was Mac Maxwell, with Harrington being the only quarterback right now. We needed a backup. I wasn't expecting his backup to be a potential starter, so this is going to be interesting. Our fourth round pick was Fred Walsh. I will admit I am slightly disappointed with this pick. Hoping for a potential starter, but he's at least decent depth. The fifth round pick was Bradley Johnston. We just gave Riola that large contract 
fact, I expected this guy to be a backup, but if he wanted to, I'm pretty sure he could start. Our sixth round pick is Ricky Gregory, another player who I think has the ability, but needs a few years to get better. It's a good thing he's sitting behind Brock Marion. Now our final pick, Brian Matthews, that's not terrible for a 7th rounder. He's better than James Davis who we cut earlier. Really quick before the season starts, there were some pre-season injuries. The secondary is decimated right now with both Brock Marion and Randall Miles will be out for a third of the season. Joey Harrington ended up regressing somehow which now means the rookie third round pick could potentially take his job away. Depending on how well the season goes. We all remember Kevin Jones having an okay rookie season. He's improved since then, and I expect better production out of him this year. One of the best players on the roster, Sly Singer, Nuff said. We only have four receivers this season, but for some reason, I felt the need to look for a backup. I noticed an injured Joey Galloway in free agency. I don't know how bad his injury is or how long he'll be out, but I took a chance on him because I have a feeling he's going to be good. He can still produce some solid numbers, he ended up having a fractured arm reason for his catching being so low, but he'll be fully healed in two weeks. This offense will be something special, I can feel it. The tight ends aren't spectacular, but not a huge drop off from last season. We signed Raiola to that long term contract, and a rookie comes in and almost takes the starting spot from him. At least we have good depth. I'll be honest, completely forgot we needed to find another guard. <laughs> that, that That's on the to-do list for next season. Both our starting tackles for the previous year have improved. We're going have to sign Bacchus next year. Remember when I thought Sean Rogers was going to be a key part of our defense for years to come? <laughs> Apparently I meant that money-wise. A lot of money just to regress. A nice surprise though, James Hall improved very well with him and Porcher starting this year. Our first round pick can continue to sit back, relax, and hopefully learn and develop. Boss Bailey leads the group at outside linebacker, which is no surprise. What is a surprise is a seventh round pick has taken over the starting job from Lehman. We got depth in the position, which is always good. Our inside linebackers both regressed pretty hard. That just means next offseason. We're going to have to prioritize that. Hopefully we don't forget about it like the guard position. As I said earlier, Randall Miles, second round pick, ended up getting injured for five weeks, which means the starter from last season will start the year. Bly is still very good, but for but Nando, not so much. Another position of need, strong safety. We didn't do anything to improve the position, and depending on how bad the pass defense is, we'll probably look for someone in free agency. With Brock Marion out for six weeks, that means our sixth round pick will be starting. Trial by fire, let's just hope our pass defense doesn't get burnt too bad. Jason Hansen is our kicker, re-signed in the offseason, while Nick Harris continues to be the punter. Week one, how will our season begin? with a loss to Seattle. Of course, it would be because our safeties can't cover. That and Roy Williams would be out for the season. It's a good thing I signed Joey Galloway. I also wanted to put a band-aid on the secondary, so I signed undrafted free agent WM Daniel. He seems pretty good. I don't know why no one wanted him, but he's ours now. Now, week two. We're 0-2 in the series against them, and now we're 0-3. We haven't lost to Chicago in the series, but that changed today. We started the season 0-3, and, and that's not great. Their first AFC team they've faced this year is the Bills. It would be the first one of the year as well. I did find that Willis McGahee was no longer on the Bills. He didn't touch the ball at all last season, but I had no problems giving him a chance as a backup on our team. I released Pinner to make some space for McGahee and signed him to a four-year deal. I plan on him being a huge part of the team in the future. Now they face another AFC East opponent, the Jets dropping to 1-4 and four in a year. We do get back Randall Miles this week, which helped them win over the undefeated Eagles. They'd hit their bye week at 2-4 and four before going on to take on the winless Washington team. They're now one game down from 500, but a loss to a very good Giants team, then going on to Miami, put the team back to three games under 500. We haven't lost to the Packers yet in the series, and we still haven't. If we want any chance of saving the season, we must win this game, and we somehow do. Now we take on the team that we've been owing three so far since I started. Uh, when will we be able to beat them? Surprisingly though, we're still in the hunt. It's not over yet, right? We're undefeated against the Packers and that doesn't change this week. Now we're only one game out of the wild card with three weeks to go. It'll be a tough challenge since this week we're up against the Falcons. Well, now the best they can do is go eight and eight, but if that happens, there's still a chance. 
they can get in. They take on Chicago, lost their first meeting, but won the second matchup to go to 7-8. and eight. Unfortunately, that's how the season ends. Vikings clinch the playoffs with their win, and the Lions are eliminated. To make it worse, they would lose the final game of the year to finish 7-9. and nine. Joey Harrington took a step back this season, but he was still decent enough. The leash is short with his backup catching up on talent alone. Kevin Jones improved, which is what I thought. I think he was the final piece that we needed to develop, but I'm starting to think it might be Harrington now. Ty Streets led the team again in yards. I'm glad I resigned them in the offseason. I'm also happy with the progression from Charles Rogers. I still think we have all the weapons on the receiving core, even more so now with Galloway on the team. I don't know if he'll be back next season, but this season we desperately needed him and he didn't disappoint. I'm not shocked that Boss Bailey led the team in tackles and he was pretty good overall. Robert Porcher once again led the team in sacks, this time with only 7.5 compared to his 15 from the year before. The rookie Ricky Gregory led the team in interceptions, just 3, but he led the team. Brian Matthews also had a pretty good rookie campaign in my opinion. Jason Hansen had a pretty good season, wasn't used much, but he did well when he was called upon. Now really quick, I hate Minnesota and I'm glad they lost to Chicago. I also hate Chicago and am really glad they lost. Now it would be nice if the Falcons lost because I don't think I've beaten them yet and well I, there's always next season right? We're not done yet. Let's move on to season 3. Six of our players will be retiring. Four of them were starters on our team at one point. Three of them were starters just last season. Brian Walker started in the first season of the series. With the signing of WM Daniel last season that means he's become obsolete. Earl Holmes has been the starting inside linebacker, but he's planning on retiring, and I'm happy to have re-signed Rayner last season as an insurance policy. Robert Porcher has finally decided it's time to call it quits. This would have been his 15th season, but the past two seasons have been phenomenal from this man. Should he be inducted into our ring of honor? One of my favorite all-time players, Brock Marion, is retiring. I thought he would have retired last season, but we gave him false hope that we could be good, so he came back. I wanted to bring him back but he wasn't drinking the Kool-Aid this time. Well, not for cheap anyways, so he's retiring. I mean, I kind of want to put him in our ring of honor. We have a few players to resign. Sean Bryson saw the writing on the wall. The moment Willis McGahee was signed, he's not coming back. Now, Joey Galloway is interesting. He was signed as a luxury. He ended up having to start, but next season he could be a part of a dynamic offense. We have the money right now, so I brought back Galloway. Bacchus was a player I said we needed to resign last season. I gave him a three-year deal to stay with us and hopefully he continues to improve. Marcus Bell is the third best player at his position. I think we can find someone cheaper in the draft. He won't be back. It'd be foolish of us to not re-sign Edwards since we have nobody left behind Hall. Lehman and Lewis both needed to be re-signed. I brought back Lehman on a three-year deal to continue to be the backup. Finally, Terrence Holt, he, 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 he's not coming back. We have a lot of cap space. We could splurge in free agency, which is headlined by Corey Dillon and followed by Gardner, McCree, Williams, Smith, Kalu, and McCollum. I was really interested in Duque Kalu since we only have two defensive ends. He can help. I did give him an offer. I also gave McCollum an offer to help out the guards position. Unfortunately, both of them didn't want to join the team, so I had to offer Justin Smiley a contract. He was the only one who accepted our contract. We did need Need help at guard and hopefully Smiley does a good job. Looks like we're going to have to go to the draft to fill in any holes. Let's go to the first round with the pick being Percy Reed. Yes, another defensive end drafted with our first pick. What can go wrong? He's already better than our previous pick. Our second round pick was Floyd Hudson. We needed help on the inside of the line and Hudson is going to be a stud. I can feel it. He instantly helps this team out. James Aguilar is our third round pick. This has to be the best player I think I've ever drafted. We got our second guarantee starter in this draft. In the fourth round, Mitchell Holt was selected. He's not the best, but defensive linemen are difficult to find in the draft. But it's okay, he's decent depth. Our fifth round pick was Leonard Horton. He's Depp, that's all he is, and that's all he needs to be. Alton Peters is a sixth round pick. Completely forgot we needed an inside linebacker. Hopefully that doesn't hurt us. Our last pick, Nicholas McDonald. I thought with the success of Brian Matthews last season, 
I thought I could replicate it. The lightning did not strike twice. So a slight surprise, Harrington improved by one point. I'll take it Maxwell is still lurking behind him and if the team doesn't start out fast he might be starting sooner rather than later. Kevin Jones will still be the starter, but on the final year of his contract, you think I should trade him with Willis McGahee improving as much as he did? Corey Slysinger, still elite, enough said. We only have two players in the 80s right now, with Roy Williams' injury causing a regression, but he's still good. I think this group of players will light up the league. The tight ends, they're just an afterthought. I think our offensive line suddenly became pretty good. Riola is still the starter, with Johnston continuing to back him up. Woody and Hudson will be the starting guards with Justin Smiley who regressed backing them up and both Bacchus and McDougal improved again to create a pretty solid offensive line. Now we go to the defensive side and well we're in trouble. Rogers improved at least got to look at the positive. Hall continues to be a solid starter while Reed might end up actually being a good first round pick. Our outside linebackers may be our best position when it comes to depth. Bailey leads the group with Matthews. I think we might have gotten a good player out of McDonald after all. Yes, I forgot about the inside linebacker. Yes, it's probably going to bite us in the butt. Now the biggest surprise, Cash taking over the number two spot at corner. I think we have a lot of decent options at number two, so if injuries do occur, it's not going to be a huge drop off in performance. Now the biggest steal in the draft, James Aguilar. Hasn't played a single down and yet he's almost a 90 overall. I thought we were playing 2k5, not Madden. I did forget about Marion retiring though, so Gregory, you're on your own this season. Lastly, Hansen is still the kicker while Nick Harris remains the punter. Let's see how the season begins. Hopefully not 0-3 and for the third straight year, we've beaten Washington. Is this a glimpse of what to see from potentially the next greatest show on turf? Well, I hope so. Week 2 against the Giants and well, there goes our undefeated season. You know, Chicago was on the bottom of the division when we started. They won it last year, so I am glad we can still beat them. Unfortunately, our amazing rookie Hudson will be out for the season with an injury. This is why we signed Justin Smiley. Beer us strength. At least we have a week to get our offensive line in sync so they can show up against Houston and they do exactly that. I mean, who needs an offensive line when you have a dump truck like Kevin Jones plowing over everyone? I really hope he takes the league by storm. Now we go and take on the 1-4 and four Buccaneers and you, you knew that was coming. In our first year, we needed to beat the Titans to get into the playoffs. We got our revenge against them this week. We can also get our revenge against the Cowboys for ending our second season on a sour note. Uh, at least we're still above 500. Now we go to Jacksonville where we get a win. Travel to Minnesota where we've never beaten the Vikings, but they finally won today. Are we good now? Has this team become the second coming of the greatest show on turf? That, well, that that's a throw we shouldn't have attempted, but maybe, you know, maybe we're just getting lucky. We've never lost to Green Bay and the streak continues against them. The Lions team is red hot right now. They just got four straight wins. They're eight and three. There's no way we collapse, right? Well, they split with Chicago and the one time they're doing good, everyone else decides to be good too. Just one game up on the wild card. Now another potential playoff matchup and they lose in a close one. Now we're not even in the seating. There's no way we don't get in after an eight and three start. Another potential playoff team and the winning streak against the Packers stays alive. Every win now is so important and this offense is going to have to be doing a lot of heavy lifting. We're back in the playoff picture, but this is getting too close for my comfort. Week 16 against Minnesota and we've swept them. We had never beaten them before and we swept them. We clinched the playoffs with that win. This is our year. We're finally gonna finish strong. Well, we're still in the playoffs. Can't take that away. Unfortunately, had we won that last game, we would have clinched the division. We've lost every season finale. Joey Harrington had a bounce back year. I'm damn proud of my boy. I believed in him. I'm sure Maxwell is pretty angry though. Kevin Jones didn't have a very spectacular season, but did have his second straight 1,000 yard season. Hard to stand out on an offense full of studs. Roy Williams is one of those studs on this team. We have so many studs, we need to start building a roof. He led in both yards and touchdowns. Charles Rogers 
Rodgers was second with seven touchdowns. This duo complements each other so well. Remember, we still have Joey Galloway. He's not as good as he was last season, but we don't need him to be. Then Ty Streets with his drop in production. He's also injured. Wally Rayner led the team in tackles as well as interceptions. He went off this season. And here I was worried about him. James Hall led the team in sacks with four and a half. We need to get some pass rushers for this team. Boss Bailey also tied with interceptions on the team with four. He's been nothing but phenomenal on this team since he's arrived. Unfortunately for the playoffs, we're going to have to be without three of our starters on this team. It's already an uphill battle towards the Super Bowl. The first playoff game will be against the division rival, the Chicago Bears. They're going to be in the Windy City in January, but the weather doesn't seem like it'll be a problem. Let's go to the end of the first quarter, third down. The Bears with the ball at the Detroit 41 yard line, shotgun formation, but they pitch it to Thomas Jones and he just plants a defender and now it's just a foot race. It's not unusual to see him do that often. The Bears take the early 7-0 lead. But if there's one thing to be said about Harrington, he's not going to stand back. He's going to drop back and throw a dime to Charles Rogers for a gain of 21 yards. A play later, Harrington will throw another floater over Erlacher to Fitzsimmons to get them into Bears territory. Now in the second quarter, Harrington with a quick throw to Williams. He's getting everyone the ball. Just outside the red zone, Harrington says, you know what, I feel like running. He gets past the sticks and gets them into a goal to go situation. Third down, Harrington has had pretty good protection, but this time it collapses and he's sacked. Forcing them to kick the field goal, Bears still lead 7-3. We go to the third quarter, last time the Bears were here, Thomas Jones took it all the way, he's not in the backfield, but I do feel something in the air tonight. The stars are bright and it's picked off by Fernando Bryant. After the interception, Detroit says, I see you have Thomas Jones, well we have Kevin Jones, who tries to make a man miss but tackled inside the 30. Remember all of last year, Roy Williams was injured. Now they have him back and he still can't get into the end zone, tackled at the one yard line. Kevin Jones says don't worry about it homie and gets in on the pitch. Detroit now leads 10 to seven. It's the start of the fourth quarter. The Bears just need to march down the field for either a touchdown or a field goal. Reyes drops back and throws into a crowd and the sixth round pick Ricky Gregory intercepts the ball. I'm sure Reyes learned a hard lesson today. Never trust a person with two first names. The Detroit Lions can put the game away, Harrington can smell it, he pumps, he throws, and it's caught by Williams for a 25 yard gain. Last time on third down, they couldn't punch it in, this time Harrington finds Galloway in the back of the end zone to extend their lead 17 to 7. We fast forward to Chicago's next drive, fourth down to keep the game alive, and knock down! The game would end after two more field goals by Detroit, a very decisive win against their division rival, and they'll be moving on to the divisional round. The second playoff game will be against a team we lost to earlier in the season by a field goal, the St. Louis Rams. The weather won't be a problem here inside the Edward Jones Dome, but the Rams offense might. We'll start with Detroit at midfield. The Lions try to set up a screen, but Harrington says nah -uh, and throws it to Roy Williams who catches the underthrown ball and runs into the end zone for the first score on the day. First play after the touchdown, the Rams say, hey, anything you can do, I can do too, but Cash is straight up money and intercepts the ball to set up the Lions in a great spot. You already saw that big play to Williams and the defense is worried about him, but you forgot this used to be Mr. Rogers' neighborhood before he showed up. Now in the red zone, Harrington throws to Galloway in the corner, but picked off, and I'm not even sure it was picked off. It looked like he dropped it, but the refs don't agree. We move to the middle of the second, Detroit with the ball, and Charles Rogers looks like he's expanding the neighborhood over over Missouri. A few plays later on the same drive, they hand it to Jones and toot, 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 runs through one guy, jukes past another, he has an angle, yee, and he jukes past another to get into the end zone. Kevin Jones straight up embarrassed the Rams defense. Rams don't have much going on for him, but how often does this happen? You throw it deep and you somehow catch it? Not only did they catch it, but they called a timeout with one second left to allow a field goal before the end of the half. Is this the changing of the tides? In the second half, Detroit got off to a quick start with Kevin Jones already having a really good game so far. He's turning into a jukebox hero out there. Later on the drive, Detroit got into St. Louis territory and what a spectacular interception for a minute. I thought Polly was one of those air dancers outside car dealership with the way his arms were flailing. Was this the change of momentum that the Rams needed because it looks like the offense got 
new life and Bolger is leading the charge. On the next play, Bolger rolls to his right, throws back to his left, and gets them into field goal range. I don't think they're thinking field goal, especially after that tackle that leads to a penalty that'll put them inside the red zone. On the very next play, one defender, two defender, doesn't matter, could put all 11 on hold and he'd still come down with it. Suddenly, that 14 point lead is now just four. We go to the final two minutes in the game. Rams have the ball, they can take the lead, but the second round pick, Miles, intercepts the ball and potentially ends the game. Third down, one minute to go to end it, to go to the NFC Championship with the first down. Jones can't get the extra yard, so they play it safe and they bring out the kicker to make sure the Rams need a touchdown just to tie. Here's their last chance to keep their playoff run alive. Bolger finds Holt over the middle to keep the drive going. On the next play, Bolger drops back, quickly throws to his left, and Miles snags the ball out of the air like Spider-Man to end the game, and with that, the Lions got their revenge over the Rams from their loss earlier in the season, and they're going to the NFC Championship game. The winner of today's game goes to the Super Bowl, the loser goes home. Detroit has had a run to remember, and this will be their biggest test so far here at Lincoln Financial Field against the Philadelphia Eagles. Let's start with Detroit. Third and 16, Harrington pumps, but Raiola doesn't give his quarterback enough time and sacked, fumbled, recovered. Only thing missing was a touchdown. And there it is on the short handoff. Philadelphia takes the early 7-0 lead. To be a successful quarterback in this league, you need to be able to bounce back from mistakes. Harrington pumps again, throws, and picked off. That's less on Harrington and more on Malcolm Joseph making a spectacular play. That puts Philadelphia in good position to score, but Ricky Gregory says yeah for us as he intercepts the ball and nobody's going to catch him as he takes it 62 yards for a score to tie the game at 7. We now go to the end of the first quarter. Detroit hasn't been able to do much, but let's not forget Kevin Jones has been doing some solid work this playoff run. Can he jumpstart this offense? A few plays later, Harrington would find Williams on a corner route to extend the drive. Ever since he's returned from his injury, Roy Williams has been a monster. He's too valuable to this team. The Eagles know it and the only way to stop it is to get to the quarterback before he has time to throw. Forcing the Lions to kick a field goal to give them their first lead on the day, 10-7. With two minutes left, the Eagles offense wants to show why they made it this far with McNabb throwing a dime to only where his guy can get it. The difference between these two offensive lines are night and day. Look at that protection for McNabb as he finds Smith over the middle. I hope everyone's got their popcorn ready because when the Eagles need a big play and there's only one guy who can do it, Terrell Owens. On the same drive in the red zone, third down, and the rookie safety Aguilar almost intercepts the ball. This defense bent but didn't break, forcing the Eagles to tie the game going into the half. We start the second half with Detroit at midfield. There's nothing quite like a quarterback trusting his receiver. Even in double coverage, Harrington has all the faith in this guy, but this time it would backfire as the defender intercepts the ball in the end zone. We skip forward to the fourth quarter. Harrington has found his favorite target again, and this time for a gain of 20. A a few plays later on the same drive, 3rd and 13, Harrington finds Williams to just get past the sticks to keep milking the clock. Now in the red zone, 3rd down, last time Harrington got sacked, this time he throws it into the dirt, which means Jason Hansen has to come out and put the team up by 3 with 2 minutes left. If there's any quarterback who knows anything can happen in the playoff, it's McNabb. He takes off with it for the 1st down, a play later to hand it off, and this Detroit defense is melting apart. Do you still have that popcorn ready? Owens always coming in big in the most important moments. There's 30 seconds left and Philadelphia is still running the ball at will and Detroit can't do anything about it. McNabb is thinking 3 points is nothing. You remember 4th and 26 as the Eagles take the lead with this easy pitch and catch. With only 22 seconds left in the game, it's Detroit's final chance. Harrington throws it to Streets, but he was Streets behind as it's intercepted and seals the game. This was Harrington's third interception on the day. Detroit is going home, but they fought hard, and they were just one drive away from the Super Bowl. Let's see if it carries over to next season. Had Detroit won, they would have faced the Buffalo Bills, who would end up winning against the Eagles in the Super Bowl. Oh, you thought it was over? Nope. We're going to season four. Five players are retiring this season. They all contributed to the team at one point or another in this franchise. The only one I'm really happy with retiring is Fernando because he was expensive. I am going to miss Big Boy. 
Dan Wilkinson. He may not be a Hall of Famer, but he's in the Hall of Very Capable Starter. Fernando wasn't worth the money he was being paid, but he did have his moment in the sun during the playoffs when he got an interception. Joey Galloway is contemplating retirement, and he's still borderline starter, along with Jason Hansen. So I gave an offer to Hansen to come back with an optional second year for him, and he accepted. I did look into bringing back Corey Slicinger, but he was too rich for my blood. I was stuck in a pickle with deciding to bring back Galloway or resigning Streets. Streets wanted $3 million to return for one year, while Galloway only wanted $2 million, and that made it easy for me to bring back Galloway for one last run. We didn't have a lot of players to resign signed this year, but we did have a good player that we weren't sure we were bringing back. We had to make the decision between Kevin Jones or Willis McGahee. Kevin Jones wanted a big contract and I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to commit to him yet. Keep in mind this past season he wasn't that good, and but by no means was he terrible, I just expected more this season. I'll hold off on Jones and focus on Streets and Hakeem. I said earlier Streets wanted 3 million for one season, while Hakeem wanted 2 million for two seasons. Just made sense to me to move on from streets and bring back Hakeem. Stefan Alexander is in need of a new contract. He did really well with the team his first season, but he's been average the past two years. I think it's just time to move on. Laverne needed a new contract, but considering he's the fourth best player at the spot, he won't be returning. And lastly, Dante Curry. He he's not coming back. I still had to decide on Kevin Jones. Coburn isn't returning, and we'd only have one back if we let him go. I caved and hoped that Jones takes the next step. If worse comes the worst, I can trade McGehee for something of value. This might be the most cap space we've had in the series, considering we were a game away from the Super Bowl, we could also be a few big signings of getting all the way there. The free agency had a few big names, Henderson, Little, Grant, and Fitzgerald, all positions we need to beef up. First and foremost, we've never had two good defensive ends at one time. Leonard Little would help beef up this defense immediately. And Sean Rogers has been nice, but he's no John Henderson. If we can get these two, our defense gets scary. And guess what? We got Henderson. He had a down year last season, but I'd gladly take that production year in and year out. Oh, and I also got Leonard. He had 18 sacks in a season, and I hope we get that version of him. Either way, I think our team got way better. We're going to move on to the draft now. Our first round pick might be a surprise, but a quarterback. Hear me out, Harrington didn't have the best playoff run, but I still trust him enough to lead this team. I just want to have an insurance policy if things go bad. Second round pick was Pat Murphy. Yes, Ricky Gregory has been doing a bang up job at free safety, but he doesn't have a backup. And uh, to be honest, I was hoping this guy was going to be rated higher like Aguilar. Third round pick, we selected Lowell Mendez. Of course, Slicinger retired and we needed a replacement. Some big shoes to fill. Travis Atkins was a fourth round pick. With Ty Street's not returning to the team, I needed to add another player for depth reasons. Hopefully he can develop. We're getting to the second half of the draft. Fifth round pick, Derek Hammond. Yes, I forgot about inside linebacker again. Thankfully, he doesn't need to start. Angel Curry was our sixth round pick. You know I love drafting late round linebackers. Unfortunately, these picks haven't really panned out lately, but depth is depth. Our final pick in the seventh round, Felipe Herrera. Look, we don't need him to start. We just need him to be capable enough for a few plays here and there. You know what's fun, preseason injuries. There goes our interior defensive line. We'll have Henderson back in two weeks, but Rodgers will be out for six, plus the obligatory Randall Miles injury. Harrington regressed back to 78, and this coming season will be make or break for him, considering he's on the final year of his contract. Maxwell's waiting behind him, foaming at the mouth, plus we just drafted another quarterback with our first round pick this offseason which means Horton, who's on the final year of his contract, is expendable. I ended up trading him to Denver where he's most likely to be a starter for a third and fifth round pick. The extra player was cut just so Denver could have room to trade with us. At halfback, we decided to stick with two running backs. Kevin Jones has improved dramatically, so I'm hoping it translates to his production as well. At fullback is Lowell Mendes, and he's, he's looking a lot better now than he did when we first drafted him. Roy Williams leads the receiving group, and boy is he becoming a beast. I still think we made the right choice with Galloway, and the rookie Atkins is coming along nicely. I forgot about the tight end. <sighs> 
I forgot about the tight end. Raiola is still the starting center and he's done well with this team since we've started the series. Now is Johnston worth a new contract to continue to be Depp? Our guards are looking really good and Smiley improved as well. I'd hope so since he started all of last year due to Hudson getting injured. At tackle, Bacchus improved again while McDougal has stayed steady. This line is looking pretty solid. You know, every time I think this team is going to be good, players get injured. At least they won't be out for too long. Leonard Little is still very healthy though and James Hall will continue to start. And dare I say, we might actually have drafted a good defensive end in Reed. Boss Bailey is in need of a new contract and he rightfully deserves one. I still think Brian Matthews is our biggest steal. Seventh round pick in our first draft. After the incredible season Rainer had last season, he'll continue to start. Dre Bly is beginning to regress and we don't really have a successor for him. Next offseason, we're going to have our hands full with this position. Aguilar continues to grow and has become an elite player on this team going into just his second year while Ricky Gregory continues to hold on to his spot at free safety but for how much longer? Of course Hansen's the kicker Harris the punter. I wasn't done making moves though, I went ahead and traded our third for an aging Sam Madison. He helps add a band-aid to the position while Randall Miles recovers from his injury. The expectations are high for us and we've already lost our first game of the year. Are we mediocre again? We'd go on to New York to drop a second game. Turns out Roy Williams is injured again. The second half of the year, we better be popping. We face another NFC East team in Dallas and drop our third straight game. I'm I'm thinking we're not good anymore. They travel to Chicago and get their first win of the year against their division rival. In the entire series, they haven't lost to Green Bay and they keep that streak alive. Now they take on Philadelphia, the team who eliminated them in the playoffs, and well, they, they still haven't had any luck against the NFC East this year. McNabb had his way with this defense when it matters and the acquisition of Madison hasn't helped the Lions much. Now they take on San Diego and have now fallen to two and five on the year. It's been a very disappointing season so far but maybe they can turn it around after the bye. They go and take on a very good Kansas City team and pull off the upset. As good as their defense has gotten I think Detroit needs to remember they still have a lot of weapons on offense like Kevin Jones. They are 7-0 against the Packers so far and make it 8-0. Fourth straight year with a sweep. I don't know why but the Lions have had the Packers number every year and on this play I can see why. If they win this game against Oakland then they'll be back to 5 500 on the year and they they actually did it they actually did it now there's no way they continue to keep the ball rolling i don't know what's going on right now they've won four straight games when this team is healthy this team is scary is there anyone that can stop them right now they host the bears they won their first game of the year against them and well they ended their winning streak i, I shouldn't have said anything they go on to take on washington who detroit has never lost to in this series and that win gets them to seven and six and believe it or not they're not even in the bubble I mean, they're there, but they're, they're not there. Every game is important for the Lions, and they split with the Vikings. Are we good again? With that win, they take the lead on the bubble, but they're still not in the playoffs yet. This is an important game here. The Rams were eliminated by the Lions last year and would love to return the favor, and they do just that. That loss will make it hard for the Lions to make it, but not impossible. But first they need to win their season finale, which they haven't done in the series, and they win against the now 1-15 Broncos. Turns out Horton wasn't the long-term answer after all. Unfortunately, the Lions didn't have luck go their way, as even going 9-7 after their terrible 2-5 start they missed out of the playoffs, Harrington wasn't the reason why this team struggled. He balled out for his second straight year. I'm surprised he wasn't Offensive Player of the Year. Kevin Kevin Jones had his most impressive year with the team. He showed why he deserved that five-year contract and he's definitely worth it. Those who are curious about McGahee, he's not spectacular. Well, this year he was, but normally he's a good change of pace back or a reliever. Roy Williams still played all 16 games despite his broken leg. He's a real Greg Jennings. Still performed as good as his previous year. Hakeem showed up big even though he's the fourth receiver on the team. Like anyone can be a star on this team. Charles Rogers also had himself a pretty decent season. Harrington has a lot of options to throw to. Joey Galloway being another one putting up pretty good numbers. The rookie Travis Atkins even got in on it and put up a good season. Boss Bailey led the team in tackles. Not a great season but still good. Leonard Little had as good of a season as he did last year considering he missed four games so I would call his signing a success. John Henderson returned to form and he 
definitely was worth the money to bring to this team. Finally, James Aguilar led the team in interceptions. The dude was a ball hawk. Now the playoffs. I'm always rooting for Miami and they would go on to the next round while Dallas, who took our spot, lost to the Rams. In probably the game of the century, Miami lost to New England. But even worse, the Bears move on to the NFC Championship game. In a shocking upset, Cleveland blew out New England and the Bears are going to the Super Bowl. When we first started the series, the Bears finished last in the division and in three years they went to the Super Bowl. To add insult to injury, they won it too. Curiously, I wanted to see who the Browns quarterback was and well, yeah, that, that guy would be the one to take them to the Super Bowl. Did I forget? We're not quite done yet. Let's go to season five. Surprisingly, the only player retiring is Hakeem, which caught me off guard. I thought Galloway might retire, but Hakeem just got a new contract last year. I did look at what he wanted to return, but I felt like he might regress too much, so I let him retire on his best year. Now, we had a lot of players that needed to be resigned. Most since the start of season two, Joey Harrington needed a new contract. He had his best season this past year, and it'd be foolish to let him walk, right? I did look into giving him an offer, but I just couldn't do it just yet. I decided to look at the other players before committing here. Both Roy Williams and Joey Galloway needed a new contract. There was no hesitation in re-signing Roy Williams. He's been consistent the past two seasons, and I just expect him to get better. He's a key piece on this offense. Now, I thought about bringing back Joey Galloway but I thought it was just time for us to move on. I did talk about Bradley Johnston last season and if he'd be worth bringing back. He's relatively cheap, but I don't want to commit such a long-term contract for a backup, so we'll be letting him go. Boss Bailey has been nothing but a stud. He's too important to this defense, so I gave him a six-year deal to remain a Lion for potentially the rest of his career. Wally Rayner is interesting because he surprised us the first year he started for the team, but at his age, it's time to move on. We've got a lot of players to re-sign at cornerback. Sam Madison is a shell of his former self. But for the price he was asking to return, I really couldn't turn that down. Dre Blight also isn't as good as he used to be, but he's the best we got. He wanted a lot of money to return, and I caved, and I, I gave it to him. Both the Cash and Smith won't be returning to the team next year. With all the key signings done, I went to Harrington and decided we had enough cap space to sign him. We have enough cap space that if we need someone in free agency, we could potentially sign him. Sadly, this year's free agency agency wasn't great. Aaron Brooks led the group and to be honest if I didn't re-sign Harrington I would have had made a push for Brooks so I decided to skip free agency this year and to move on to the draft. Our first round pick was Gordon Lindsay. Our tackles are getting older and we need someone ready to take over when the time comes. This is the guy. Our second round pick was Domingo Morgan. Would you look at that we didn't forget about inside linebacker this season. Just took us about five years. Our third round pick that we got from Denver was Alton Gross. We desperately need a corner of the future. Let's hope Madison and Bly can teach him well. Bernard Daniels was our fourth round pick. He's not as good as I hoped he would be, but we finally have ourselves a nard dog. Now our first of two fifth round picks, this one coming from Denver, Andres Stanley. In a couple of years, he might be starting over Riola. Then again, I said the same thing about Johnston. Not a bad pick for a fifth rounder. Our second fifth round pick was Isaac Leonard. We're desperate for corners and maybe he can develop to be at least a decent backup. Our sixth round pick, Jimmy Lopez. This player is a steal for a sixth rounder. The only problem is I thought he was a free safety. And the final pick, Willard Swanson. You already know me. I love drafting linebackers in the late rounds. Preseason injuries were kept to a minimum. Woody would only be out for two weeks while McGahee will only miss one game. Let's look at the roster. Harrington was given a long-term deal this offseason, which means Maxwell's future on this team is in doubt. Well, it is. I ended up trading him and a fourth round pick to the Colts for a second rounder. Suddenly, I realized I can make trades. We had a few too many safeties and I traded WM Daniel to Denver for a washed up Sean Springs and a fifth round pick. Oh, and I wasn't done there. I went to another overcrowded position at linebacker. I traded Lehman and two fifth round picks for Dante Hall and a fourth rounder. All right, no more trades, I promise. Harrington is our starter while the former first rounder Jennings will continue to sit behind and learn. Kevin Jones continues to be one of the most important players on this offense while McGahee will be his backup. Really quickly, I did sign a backup to the backup since McGahee is currently out for one week with his own injury. Lowell Mendes is coming along really nicely at fullback. Other than Roy Williams and Charles Rogers, our wide receivers are completely different since year one. Now you can see why we traded for Dante Hall. We needed the human joystick. We're actually not that bad at tight end. I mean, we 
could be better, but we're not bad. At center, Raiola continues to start while Stanley the Manly is waiting in the wings. Woody is currently injured for two weeks, but Hudson and Smiley should be able to hold the line until then. I think we've reached the potential of Bacchus and McDougal, which means Lindsay might end up making an appearance sooner than later. Sean Rogers regressed, but that's not as important since John Henderson is a beast. He should make Rogers look better. Both Little and Hall continue to anchor down the defensive end spots, while Bailey and Matthews continue to start at the outside linebackers, you gotta love consistency. Domingo Mango will start at the inside linebacker position, first rookie starting this year, while Bly and Gross will be starting at corner. The second rookie starting this year, there's a lot of depth behind them as well with Springs, Madison, and Miles. Aguilar will be starting at strong safety, Ricky Gregory at free safety, Hansen at kicker, Harris at punter. Let's start the season, shall we? We open the first four games against the NFC East. They start the year with a win in their home opener. If this is any indication of the way the season is going to be, we're in for a good ride. Brian Matthews with a pick six. Week two against Philadelphia and the Lions finally get their revenge. You know what's funny? We traded for the human joystick and we don't even have him back there to return kicks. It's like he gave us his energy. Now they take on the Giants. That's three straight wins. Keep in mind they've never lost to Washington and a win here would sweep the East. Detroit just swept the NFC East. Now they host the Bears and the Lions are 5-0. How much longer will the streak last? Another week at least with that win over Arizona. Again, we have Dante Hall on our team and yet we've already had more returns with him just on the roster, not even returning the kicks. Now, Detroit travels to New England to keep the undefeated season going. They're now 7-0. There's nothing better than completing half of the season, well, almost half, undefeated and getting a bye week midseason. They now take on the Jets and they, they, they lost. It's just one game. They're still 7-1, taking on the Bills, and they lost again. Please don't collapse. They take on my favorite team, Miami, and they win to get to 8-2 on the year. And that's more like it. Now on to Minnesota. Please. Why? We've never lost to the Packers. Please not now. The Lions are now 9-3. 9-3 is nice. Now they go on to Tampa Bay and they lose another game. The Lions are first right now, but not by much. They can easily get sent into the bubble. All they need to do is win. Please, don't tell me that sent them to the bubble. They're six. They were just first last week. This is going to be crazy, isn't it? Well, they get a chance to redeem themselves against the Vikings, which they do. And with that win, they clinch the playoffs. That's a huge relief. They started 7-0. Then they went 2-5 and five before getting that win. We don't necessarily need to win this last game, but it would be nice to sweep the Packers for a fifth straight season. And we swept the Packers for a fifth straight season. And the Lions somehow ended up with the number one seed, home field advantage in a bye week. Every other team finished with an 11-5 record. What an insane season finale. Joey Harrington didn't have the weapons like before, so he regressed, but still performed very well. I'm shocked Kevin Jones got worse in terms of running, but became a threat as a receiver in the backfield, which means McGahee picked up some of the slack behind on the ground. Roy Williams had another outstanding season, led the team in receiving yards and touchdowns. Charles Rogers is such a nice compliment to him, and these two will be the duo to watch in the playoffs. Domingo Morgan led the team in tackles, and to be honest, he was very good. So good, in fact, he got Rookie of the Year. The first award we've had in the series, it's about time. Leonard Little led the team in sacks this season with 10, while James Aguilar continued to be a ball hawk. Our linebackers have been balling out this season. Bailey was pretty good this year. While Matthews finally finished his first full season since his rookie year, we will be without Ricky Gregory for the playoffs. Last time he was very impactful, so he will be missed. Let's see who we'll be facing in the playoffs. And of course, a rematch against the Bears from two years ago, also from this year and, and from last year. It's been a year, but the Lions are back in the playoffs hosting the defending Super Bowl champions. They beat them the last time in the playoffs. Can they do it again? We start in the bottom of the first quarter. Is it? It is. It's boss time as Bailey intercepts the ball and takes it to the house to give Detroit an early 7-0 lead. Chicago's back on offense though, but this line can't hold a sneeze, let alone Rodgers and Henderson. This might be a long day for Reyes. On the same drive, third down, who needs blocking with an arm like that? Fired one into Lopez for the first down. A play later, Reyes fires one out of a cannon. I don't think Aguilar saw it. Ross isn't going to catch him and Lopez helps Chicago tie the game 7-7. Now we 
we go to the start of the second half, Reyes throws a rainbow deep, and this is where you miss Ricky Gregory because I don't know what that man was doing standing at midfield. And he's gone. Chicago takes the lead, 14-7. Now Detroit hasn't done much on offense, but Harrington would find Williams for a 22-yard gain. A few plays later in Chicago territory, Harrington would find Rodgers for another 26. A play later, Detroit in the red zone, Harrington can't find anyone open and decides to take off within himself, and Superman dives for the first. First and goal, they hand it off to Jones, who gets swallowed up behind the line. Second and goal, they go back to Jones on the right side, but Chicago isn't giving them anything. Third and goal, Harrington decides, screw it, but his own lineman got in the way and tackled short. They go for it on fourth down, Harrington tries to be a hero, but denied at the line by the law. Chicago with a goal line stand. All Chicago needs to do now is run the clock, take care of the ball, but Dre Bly, oh my, intercepts the ball and scores to tie the game at 14. This Lions defense is single-handedly keeping them in the game. We go to the middle of the fourth quarter, Lions ball, Harrington rolls to his right and runs with it for the first down. A few plays later, third down, Harrington throws to his favorite target, Williams, to just get outside the red zone. Now you would think they would just run the clock from here on out, Jones takes it right and tackled inside the red zone. Third and inches before the two minute warning. <laughs> somehow runs over three guys to get the first down. Now they're in a goal to goal situation. Last time they couldn't get in. Second down, they give it to Jones up the middle and he gets in for the score. But wait a minute, a review shows that he was tackled inches short. Now third and inches. Pitch to Jones and he's eaten up behind the line, forcing Detroit to bring out the kicker to make it a three point game. Reyes has a chance to win the game for Chicago, completing a short pass for eight yards. They are the Super Bowl defending champions for a reason. Reyes with another quick pass, they're marching now. Third and seven, Reyes with a clean pocket throws and knocked down by Aguilar. He wasn't letting it happen on him again. Fourth down, keep the game alive and Reyes throws a wild one into the dirt. The game is over. Detroit is going to the NFC Championship game and how confident must they be after putting up three points and getting shut down at the goal line. Their opponent next week, the New York Giants. The Lions made their way back to the NFC Championship game and this time they plan on going all the way to the Super Bowl. The only team left in their way, the New York Giants, led by former Super Bowl MVP Kurt Warner and he looks like he still has something left in the tank. I think he wants to prove to everyone Everyone, he's still a Super Bowl caliber quarterback and I think he's right. The drive would stall there and they would end up putting the first points in the game. Giants up 3-0. Detroit had a lot of trouble last week against Chicago and this week it continues as Harrington had to run away from pressure and throws his first interception of the game, setting up the Giants in very good field position. But Detroit's defense has been playing lights out so far and Alton Gross doing the best he can with what he's got comes away with the interception. Harrington has a chance to redeem himself, finding his favorite target, a play later, a pitch to Jones who finds the edge and helps get Detroit moving the sticks. Now at midfield, same drive, Harrington found out that he can't throw interceptions if he just runs with it and gets 15 on the ground. Next play, back to Jones on a sweep and yee, big boy gets a pancake, one guy to beat him up and he's gone. Detroit takes the lead 7-3. We move to the middle of the second quarter, Harrington has plenty of time and he's got a lot of trust in Williams who makes the catch. Next play, they give it to Jones who gets gets not just one block but two from his guy and he's bringing this team to life. Now third down in the red zone and Harrington throws to the legend Roy Williams for a touchdown. They're now ahead 14 to 3. Second quarter isn't over yet. Detroit wants some more points. Harrington finds Rodgers to get them into the New York territory. Less than a minute left in the half. Harrington finds Williams over the middle this time. They're in position for a field goal. Harrington pumps to his left, rolls to his left, throws off balance and picked off. Harrington is the only one in front but knocked down nobody is going to catch up to him and just like that the Giants are back in this game before halftime still behind but not by much 14 to 10 now, if you would have told me this was Kurt Warner throwing these dimes, I wouldn't believe you. He seems like a completely different player in the playoffs. Another beautiful throw. Later on the drive, they would be on the edge of field goal range, third down, and knocked down at the line. The reason I'm showing you this, instead of kicking a potential 54-yard field goal, they opted to punt it instead of making it a one-point game. Reason it's important? Final two minutes. They need to march down the entire field for a touchdown instead of a field goal to win. But with the way Kurt Warner has been playing, anything is possible. 
possible, but Randall Miles shut that down quick and seals the game on the interception. And for the second straight week, the Lions defense has sealed the game. And now, they're going to the Super Bowl. It took five seasons, but we finally made it to the Super Bowl. Joey Harrington hasn't been having the best postseason in history, but he's doing enough to win. The defense has been bailing them out and doing everything they can to make sure this is the year. Their opponent, the Tennessee Titans. First play of the Super Bowl, Joey Harrington sacked by Keith Bullocks. Harrington says it's fine and rolls to his right on the next play to find Rodgers for the first down. A few plays later, third down, Harrington steps up in the pocket, throws on the move to Hall who bobbles and catches it. Next play, Harrington has plenty of time but no one to throw to, dumps it down to McGahee for a decent gain. A few plays later, Harrington would find his favorite target, Williams, for a first down. On the same drive, third down, Harrington panicking, throws, but knocked away in the end zone, forcing Detroit to bring out Hanson to get the first point in the Super Bowl. Here's Tennessee's first chance to show why they're in the Super Bowl. Patterson would connect with his tight end on third down. A play later, it looks like the same play. It might be, as Patterson throws to the same guy and Gross can't make the play before Aguilar tackles him out. Now they're in the red zone and Patterson throws to Bennett for an easy pitch and catch. Titans are now leading, 7-3. The Detroit offense has been stagnant in the playoffs. Harrington has too much trust in Williams and the defender just cuts the route for the pick. Now the Titans have a chance to extend the lead and they don't look like they're slowing down a few plays later. Third down, Patterson forces one of Bennett and Aguilar makes a great over the shoulder interception. Detroit needs to get something going. It's the start of the second quarter. Look at Harrington, he's just panicking and he gets sacked. A play later, instead of playing it safe and running on third down, the Lions take the chance and throw it deep and it's picked off for the second time today. Nothing would come from the turnover and Detroit would get the ball back again, but they can't do much. They even decided to go for it and fourth down in their own territory from frustration and Harrington throws his third interception on the day. And it's going to put the Titans in excellent position. At this point, it seems like the Lions are trying to give the game away. Titans playing it safe. Keep it on the ground, they'd run it again on the next play. How do you stop a bulldozer? You don't. After a penalty that got them inside the 10, Patterson throws to Mason for another easy pitch and catch and they extend the lead 14-3. Detroit hasn't exactly done much good today, but they haven't let Jones touch the ball much and maybe he can give this team a spark. A play later, with a minute left in the half, Harrington has plenty of time, throws it deep, Dante Hall, the human joystick, makes the catch, entered the cheat code, got in for the score before the half to shorten the lead. We go to the middle of the third, Harrington has protection, throws over the middle to Dante Hall. On the next play, Harrington steps to his right, moves to his left, and decides to run with it. Can't throw a pick if you don't throw. Near midfield, Harrington finds his favorite target, and now they're in Titans territory. A few plays later on third down, Harrington finds an open haul, but it closes up quickly and he fumbled it. Titans recover and is that the end of the Detroit comeback? We move forward to the middle of the fourth quarter and now the Titans are on the move to end the game. In Detroit territory, three minutes left in the game and Patterson throws over Gross who can't make the play and tackled at the 20. All the Titans need to do is run the clock and force Detroit to go down the field to tie after the field goal. And here comes the kick to make it a seven point game. It's leaning and he misses it. Detroit can still win with the touchdown. The question is, can they get a touchdown? Harrington throws to Jones, one defender in front of him, makes him miss and gets close to the first. A few plays later, Harrington has time, moves to his right, decides to run, gets past the first and gets into Titans territory. Third down, less than a minute to go. Harrington throws to Williams, but it's off target. Fourth down, Harrington moves to his left and takes off with it and gets the first. A few plays later, third down and Harrington is sacked. They have to burn their last time out. Fourth down, everything comes down to this play and Harrington hits Roger, Roger for the first down. Time is running out, tick, 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 tick. They get everyone to the line, but I don't think they even know what they're going to call. Harrington snaps the ball, throws and it's tipped, but the game isn't over. Two seconds left, it all comes down to this. Harrington throws to the end zone, and Williams was wide open, miscommunication by the defense, and Detroit just won their first Lombardi. That was a wild ride at the end there. 
I do want to thank everyone for sticking around through the entire video to watch it. I really do appreciate it. Every view matters, so does a like and a subscribe sharing as well. I hope you enjoy these type of videos as I might start doing longer ones. In doing so, they'll take longer to make and I already know what I'm going to do on my next video, so see you then.